My name is Ryan Carpenter. Uh, as you can tell, I work for the National Park Service. Um, and I'm really honored and humbled to be here and to be able to represent the agency that I work for and to be able to present at the Clinton Conference. Um, in the five years that I have lived here in Sitka, it's been a real honor to be associated with the cultural programs that go on at the park. Um, and I'm excited to be able to share some of those experiences with you today. And I think, you know, reflecting on the Klan Conference and reflecting on the programming that's been going on at the park over the last five years, I think there's some really interesting similarities. And one is, is that, you know, there are people that are coming from all over the United States, uh, all over the world to come to this conference because of that appreciation um, and uh, willingness to want to learn and understand Southeast Alaska Native culture and Klingon culture. Um, and one of the big benefits of the programming that we do at the park is, is likewise, um, folks that are interested in this culture like yourself, um, you know, the, the, the cruise passengers and the independent travelers, travelers that come to the park are seeking authentic experiences to interact with Alaska Native artists and culture bearers. Um, and because of the uh, forward thinkers that Brendan talked about, uh, like Alan Hope Hayes, um, who developed this program, you know, we are fortunate enough to be able to carry that torch um, and to be able to provide that. And so my goal for you today is not to necessarily talk about the history of the Cultural Center. I'm going to do that briefly. I am not an expert on that. Um, there are people that are in this room that have more experience with the history of the Cultural Center than I do. But what I do have a lot of experience with is the last five years of cultural programming and demonstration that's going on at the park. So we're going to touch a lot on that. We're also going to focus on some of the other side projects that are loosely associated with um, the demonstration arts program. And that focuses on the next generation of youth who um, you know, we as a park and our partners have um, partnered with to try to ensure that, that, that cultural knowledge is instilled in the next generation, um, as well as other projects like the Canoe Project. So it's going to be a little bit of a big smash of everything. Um, and so in saying that, the demonstration arts program has changed pretty extensively over the years, and we'll touch on that briefly. But before that, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the park, and I'll try not to be redundant um, from what Brennan discussed. Um, of course, the park sits on Clinket Ani or Clinket land. It's been that way for uh, 10,000 years. And so that component um, of the park's history and Sitka's history is always rooted and essential um, in you know, the, the foundation of the park and a lot of the primary themes related to the park. Um, the secondary large component is, of course, the Russian colonial period in the late 1700s when the Russians arrived, um, and those interactions and eventual conflict, especially uh, in the Battle of 1804. And so three of the, you know, the primary events or primary resources that focuses um, so much on the, cult, on the park's primary interpretive themes or our driving themes that we discuss, at least in the Division of Interpretation, um, would be that battle, the Battle of 1804. Um, the collection of totem poles that was um, collected uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s brought to St. Louis uh, for the 1904 World's Fair, Portland for the 1904 um, Lewis and Clark Exposition, and then later brought to Sitka, what is now Sitka National Historical Park um, in around 1906. The other major event that I think one of my colleagues has discussed at all of the presentations today is the 1972 purchase of the Russian Bishop's House. So the combination of those three major events, acquisitions, um, has really shaped the park and the direction of the park um, and the direction of those interpretive themes that we focus on and that are kind of our guiding principles in what we do. Um, so with that being said, if you look at those six primary interpretive themes, which are very hard to read, but the good thing is we're only going to focus on two. So I will switch to the next slide where you can read them very well. Um, and of those six themes, there are two that really um, connect with um, the demonstration arts program and other cultural programming that we have here in the park. Um, and so one focuses a, a lot on that totemic art that Brennan touched on pretty extensively, but I think there's some really key words that are included in that that are going to help guide us in our conversation today. Um, and that is showcasing the talents and cultures of Native people. And so that is one of the things that we are, in essence, mandated to do. And I would argue that one of the ways that we're successful at doing that is through art demonstrations and cultural programming. 
Um, the second would be uh, fostering the preservation and interpretation of Southeast Alaska Native culture. And so that's not only the arts, but that's much broader and focused on the cultural culture as a whole. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I look at that and I think about those directions that the park is supposed to go, I, I recognize that, you know, without the partnerships that Brennan spoke a little bit about, it would be very challenging to be able to achieve those goals. And I think one of the big legacies of this project is the partners and is the collaboration and also is uh, the shared values and shared goals of those strategic partners that have been built over time. And so um, a and of course, was the first group that the National Park Service partnered with, um, with the establishment of this demonstration arts program in the 60s. And if we look at their mission statement, again, there's some key words that really stand out. Um, the betterment of the lives of Native people. Uh, the demonstration arts program, as you'll see, um, I would argue, and from the feedback that I get from artists, uh, provides uh, really a, a great, important uh, opportunity for Alaska Native people, culture bearers, and artists. Um, so I think there's an alignment there. Uh, when it comes to civil rights uh, and land rights issues, it's a, it's a venue for uh, those same culture bearers and artists to be able to have some of those discussions with people that um, you know, are coming here for the first time. Um, a lot of those people, not to generalize, but I'm going to generalize a little bit, don't have a lot of background and information about Alaska Native people. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to be able to um, have some really uh, honest and open conversations. And for those folks that are interested in learning to be able to learn um, from Alaska Native people themselves. Um, and then the one I'd really like to point out is to share the cultural knowledge, wisdom, and artistic beauty of Native tribal society. Um, you know, these three goals really align perfectly with many of the goals of the demonstration arts program that we have in the park. Um, and so that is one key element of the success of this program is, is that over the years, the three major um, partners that the park has established um, have had a shared vision. That is so important. Um, I would also important, uh, I would also rather um, like to highlight the importance of the location. And besides being like the most beautiful view ever, I will tell you that my office used to look out on there and it is the best view in the history of the world. I never thought I'd see whales breaching from my office window, but it happened. Um, what I mean by location is not that. What I mean by location is, this, is the strategic nature in which the, the visitor center was built. Um, you know, I... I I'm, I'm going to generalize again, I'm doing a bad job at this, but I'm going for it. A lot of national park rangers um, spend a lot of their free time visiting national parks and going to other national parks. Um, I think I see some nods, okay, especially from wives. <laughs> um, but, you know, in my experiences, I've seen a lot of demonstration programs. In fact, um, I got to go to the Grand Canyon just a few, about a year ago, and there was an awesome demonstration program that was happening in the Grand Canyon. Um, but the one difference I noticed between this program and those programs is the, the facility. The facility is so important. Um, and because when the, when the visitor center was built and those studio spaces that Brennan pointed out earlier were included and incorporated into the design of the visitor center, that was so crucial for the success of this program because it created a designated space for Alaska Native artists to be able to, uh, you know, use their craft and um, connect with people. And so there was a sense of ownership there, um, as there should be, right? Um, and so I just think that that component is so key and so different than many other demonstration programs where, you know, maybe an artist will set up in a visitor center and they'll have a table and they'll be there temporarily for a few hours. And so um, for me, one of the things that I thought was really um, important um, from the people that came before us was the designation of this specific space. Um, most of you have been to that space. There are three cultural center studios. So this is uh, the regalia room in which beading, weaving, uh, and basketry work is done. There's the late Terry Rothkar who spent uh, many years and many hours on her craft in the, the regalia room as um, is many other uh, world-renowned artists. Uh, this is a picture of the carving studio with Tommy Joseph, um, someone who spent uh, more than 21 years carving in the cultural center. Um, 
refining his craft. And it usually doesn't look like this. I happened to take this picture on a day there wasn't a cruise ship in. Typically the room is absolutely packed. Um, and then lastly, there's a, a metal studio in the cultural center hallway as well. Um, one of the other, in my opinion, crucial components of the success of this program and this sense of ownership and connectivity to the park and to the studios is the objects that are found in and around the studios. Um, when I have spoken to artists and they talk about the reverence they have for this place, a lot of it has to do with the footsteps that they're following in. And those footsteps are so evident when you just walk into the studio and there are objects that were carved 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago by some of the people that were the first people to work in the studios. And so to be constantly surrounded and inspired by these amazing pieces of culture and artwork um, really adds to the ambiance of the place and the significance for those artists that are working in those studios. I have a few anecdotes to share with you at the end of the program about people who learned their craft in these studios and are now, are now participating in the demonstration arts program. And I will say for them, um, to be able to walk in those studios and see their teacher's artwork on the walls is a really powerful uh, element. And just, you know, I think in general just very significant for them. And so, with that being said, I think that's another really critical element of success. Um, the other is having clear goals and uh, expectations. And so, um, from my research, you know, it seems like the goals of this program have been pretty similar from the very beginning. One of the primary goals is providing opportunities for Alaska Native people to pass their knowledge from one generation to the next, ensuring that cultural preservation. And this is a permanent place where that um, should happen. Um, continue around. Oh, you can come in if you'd like. Okay. Um, so that is one really critical element. We'll talk about how the park is currently um, trying to facilitate that in a moment. Uh, apprenticeship programs. There is a long history of apprenticeship programs. Uh, many of you will notice Nick Glannon. Uh, this is a very young picture of Nick. Uh, he um, apprenticed under Louis Menard, uh, a world-renowned silversmith in the Cultural Center Studios. Um, and as many of you know, because Nick is local, um, you know, he now has objects that are all around the world and is a world-renowned artist. He um, helped out in the canoe carving and was there, obviously, for the um, dedication of the canoe. And so uh, that space and that opportunity to be able to have um, you know, master artists share their craft with uh, you know, new uh, artists or artists that are on their way up is a, a really important element. And something that Brennan kind of pointed out that is, I mean, it's an opportunity for the park right now. There's not a lot of apprenticeships that are going on. Um, in addition to that, uh, just in general, the demonstrations that happen during the summer. Uh, so we have more than 150,000 cruise ship passengers that come to Sitka uh, you know, every summer. And the vast majority of them spend, mm, at a minimum, 20 minutes at the park, 20, 25 minutes, at a maximum, an hour, hour and a half. Um, and one of the, the highlights for those, uh, those folks that are visiting is to be able to interact with visitors and to be able to speak with master artists um, and folks that are willing to share their knowledge and their culture. So that's a really critical legacy of the park. And so, um, you know, yeah, there are some really in-depth programs that happen here in our community, but the roots of the cultural center spread much farther than just Sitka. And there are people all around the world um, that treasure their experiences of being able to interact with artists in these studios. And then lastly, let's get back to those local roots, uh, workshops and opportunities for the general public to be able to learn and appreciate cultural history. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this workshop in a minute, but this is Robert Davis Hoffman, who um, is a local artist and poet, um, among other things. He's very talented, um, leading a form line design workshop uh, in the park that was free and open to the public. And so the free park is... Um, and so with that being said, before I dive into some of the current programs, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the Southeast Alaska Indian Cultural Center, which Brennan again spoke about, and the significance of that program. Um, many of the artists uh, that you saw there today worked under that um, 501c3, that nonprofit, um, and you know, that was just a critical, it's a critical history in the parks um, and the community's legacy. Uh, I will brief, 
don't even know if I need to talk about Ellen. Everybody has heard so much about Ellen and how amazing she is. She was terrific, is an amazing woman, and was critical on the establishment of this program. Um, today, uh, the, the connection and the partnership um, has transferred between the A&B to then the Southeast Alaska Indian Cultural Center to today the Sitka Tribe of Alaska. And so between the Park Service and the tribe, we're collaborating to create this demonstration arts program. And the goals of the demonstration arts program today are in essence the same as they have been for the almost 50 years that it's been in existence. Um, I would say one component that the park um, is really focused on is, is that it provides an opportunity for tribal citizens to maintain a strong connection with tribal lands. And so that's not something that we've necessarily talked about up to this point, but an important component of that program. So the way the program is organized is this. Um, the demonstration arts program runs throughout the summer season when we have busy cruise ship passengers. Uh, we have had anywhere from about six to a dozen artists that have worked throughout the summer. It's not a full-time uh, job, it's a part-time job um, that the, the artists are paid through that collaboration or cooperative agreement with the Sitka Tribe of Alaska. Um, and they demonstrate throughout the, the, the busy part of the day. Um, and what's, what's different about this is historically there were typically a few artists that were full-time employees during the summer that worked five days a week. And so this is a little bit different. I'd say there's pros and cons with either one. Um, but one of the pros with this is, is that it's providing a lot more opportunities for a lot of artists with a very different, um, I shouldn't say different, with a, a, a varied background. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just highlight a few of those artists and their background um, and talk about how they participate in the program in different ways. We've talked about Tommy a little bit. Um, 21 years working uh, at the Southeast Alaska Indian Cultural Center and he has worked um, in the demonstration arts program for a couple of years. And so he is um, got objects that are in museums all throughout the world. He's world renowned. Um, and he's an example of someone who learned his craft in the cultural center, um, you know, had a background in art and a background in carving, but really honed his craft here to the point where you know, he became a full-time artist. Um, and that is how he is making his living today. Um, and so that's an example of someone who is really uh, transformed himself um, within the studios that um, you might become familiar with. Uh, Sarah Williams is an Athabascan beater, and so the, the program is not limited to Southeast Alaska Native artists. We've had artists, uh, we've had Athabascan artists, we've had a Lutic artist. Um, there's been artists that are from all throughout and representative of Alaskan cultures throughout. Um, and so Sarah Williams is a, an Athabascan beater. And one of the, the things that I and most excited about when it comes to Sarah is, is that she and her connection to the park is really interesting. Before she started demonstrating, she took a couple of workshops. She didn't need to take the workshops. She was an amazing beater already. But that's how she established her relationship or began to establish her relationship with the park. We've had a number of different carvers. Uh, Abel Ryan from Juno has been a part of the program, and he's a Sitka fixture. Um, Teresa Moses was a weaver that we've had um, that's worked in the park. Uh, Simshian artist Mark Sixby, who painted the canoe that you saw, it was dedicated the other day. Um, and then uh, metal engraver Jeff Sheekley uh, got his start in the Cultural Center. We'll talk a little bit more about Jeff in a few minutes, but um, another one of the cool legacies of this program. So that demonstration element is critical and serves a lot of the needs of the park and the needs of the partners. Um, but we wouldn't be able to successfully um, focus on all of those interpretive themes related to Native art and culture with just the demonstration arts program. And so the park and the tribe have strategically come up with other programs to be able to um, ensure that we're meeting all of those expectations. And one of them uh, is this winter workshop series. Um, little plug, we are planning a winter workshop series for this winter, so keep your ears open and there's the potential uh, for again free adult uh, workshops this winter as the education coordinator at the park i hear more times than not the kids get to do all this cool stuff when do we get to do it so <laughs> this winter you get to do it <laughs> um but yeah the workshops um that we that we did a couple of winters ago were very successful and very well received so robert davis hoffman did an introductory program on form line design and so the 
it was about fit, we were at capacity, it was about 15 um, participants um, did this four week course where it was uh, met one night a week for four weeks. Um, and by the end, um, after they learned the fundamental principles of form line design, they all created their own form line design and then shared that with the class as a, a formative project. Um, so that was, that was really neat and a really awesome opportunity to be able to see Robert um, in his element. Another really cool component of this, hearkening back to the, you know, that legacy of those objects that are throughout the park, you know, uh, during the form line design class, Robert was able to walk around and talk about the stories and the history of all the objects that he has uh, within the cultural center, uh, including um, this history panel. So it was really neat for people to be able to see how he used form line of design to construct these, uh, you know, these meaningful panels, these meaningful house posts um, to tell the stories that he was um, so interested in telling. So that was a really cool component. Next, again, going off a theme that is not all Southeast Alaska, um, this is Anna Bennett, and she did an Athabascan beading workshop. And so uh, they, meaning the group of people, about 15, um, took about two months, this was a much more intense workshop, where they met twice a week, uh, to bead two non-clan affiliated designs that were to go on uh, a back of, the back of a pair of gloves. And so this is uh, Lizzie, she was one of the park interns that got to participate in the program, um, who I report says that those gloves come in handy in Washington State where she lives now, that's really chilly. Uh, but you can see her getting started. This is one of the demonstrating artists from this year, Sarah Williams participating in the workshop. She was more of like a co-teacher almost because she's so experienced, but you can see her design. And this is another really cool story. Uh, this is Leota Bigby, she's a, a local artist. and. By participating in this workshop, it gave Viota the confidence to be able to apply for and gain employment in the demonstration arts program. And so these workshops serve a number of different purposes. Um, they're not only to be able to you know, provide opportunities for folks to be able to appreciate and understand Native culture, but it's a vehicle to pass that knowledge on from generation to generation and to empower um, artists that are interested in pursuing this as a job to be able to do that. And Leo is a perfect example of that. Um, so with that being said, other components of the parks uh, program relate to special projects that we have. Um, I'm going to talk uh, two special projects. One that many of you are very familiar with. That's the canoe carving project. Just heard Steve Brown, uh, the master carver, canoe carver, I should say, um, on this project speak about the process. But, you know, again, that legacy of cultural preservation and passing down knowledge from generation to generation was the catalyst for this, this project. And so with a combination or partnership between Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and the National Park Service, um, you know, a number of different individuals and agencies came together to be able to facilitate this, this project. Um, and you can see Steve there uh, with TJ Young, uh, Rosita World, the director of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, uh, and then um, Nick and Jared Glannon. And so those four, I, I can't even believe I could call them, they are not apprentices. <laughs> These four artists are like some of the most amazing artists that we have in Sitka. But for this project, they were considered canoe apprentices because they had not been able, they had not learned this craft um, to the degree in which they had wanted to. And so some of them had some experience, but they wanted more experience. And what was neat was is that as the project was developing and as uh, it was moving forward, you know, it wasn't us necessarily recruiting artists. It was more so artists, you know, asking to participate. I remember some conversations that Brendan had with artists where they were like, I heard that you're carving a canoe. I really want to be part of this project. And so, it, you know, it ballooned from being just a couple of artists that were going to be the apprentice artists to having four. Um, and so that legacy... Uh, that Steve um, and others were able to share with these artists and those tools and resources um, is that much bigger. And so, um, with that being said, I know that many of you weren't able to witness the carving of the canoe. Anybody want to see it? Okay. <laughs> Great. So, if you would like to see the carving of a Northwest Coast style dugout canoe in 46 seconds, here you go. Um, Video credit and music credit to Nick Glannon, 
And photo credits to about 8 million park staff who went out and took a picture every single day for like 8 months. So, here we go. to be able to involve local tribal elders to guide this program. If it wasn't for the elders um, and them sharing the traditional values and the traditional cultural protocol related to the canoe carving project, it would have not been a success. And so um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about this. This was an evening that uh, the artists and the park hosted where uh, elders came down um, and we started to plan the process of the dedication of the canoe, the naming of the canoe, how that would happen. They wanted to see the process. They wanted to talk to the carvers about how that was moving forward. And so that was a really cool um, evening and connection. And then lastly, you know, Thursday night, uh, what more do I need to say about that? It's pretty <laughs> magical. Um, and you know, one of the components that we haven't talked about is the kids' involvement in the carving of this canoe. Um, so throughout the year, uh, there were a number of partnerships that happened with the Sika Native Education Program, uh, the Sika School District, a lot of independent contractors to provide education programming's re programs related to the canoe. And so more than 500 kids came to the park and learned from cultural bear culture bearers and educators and the artists themselves about the canoe carving process and why this is significant. And so when many of these kids were also the kids that got to put their handprint on the canoe that symbolized that next generation. I really think that there's this legacy with this canoe, hopefully, that maybe a couple of those kids in 10 or 15 years might be a part of the next canoe carving project in Sitka. Um, and so that's another way that all of these people have been able to help facilitate that passage of knowledge from one generation to the next, and hopefully that continued commitment to Native arts like this. The last project I wanted to talk to you about is the Clinkett Regalia project. And it's by far the most adorable project we're going to be talking about today. And so this project was an initiative to um, connect, again, same partner, STA, Sick and Native Education Program in the school district, and to offer free workshops uh, after school for kids to be able to learn about Native culture and cultural practices. And so these workshops had a number of elements in it. The measurable was that at the end of the program, they made something that they were really proud of, as you can see in their faces in these pictures, um, that represented different elements of culture. And so the three projects were a Tana making workshop. You can see this young guy having his Tana necklace. That was pretty neat. Um, an octopus bag workshop. So Tanas were for, uh, so this was first, kindergarten and first grade. This was first and second grade, and vest making workshops were for third, fourth, fourth and fifth grade. Um, and so the goal of that was is that they to learn how to make these objects, why they're culturally significant, connecting with culture bearers, educators, and elders about the reason that these objects are made, the reason they're in the shape that they're in, uh, when they're worn, why they're worn during these periods of time, the cultural significance of these objects. And then um, they were to dance these objects at their SNEP graduation at the end of the year, which I have a little bit of a video on that I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, and so, you know, again, just working with culture bearers, this is uh, Lucretia, and she is talking to the kids and walking them through the steps as to why the octopus bags 
um, have the, for lack of a better term, the little tentacles that are at the bottom, and how we're going to attach these two pieces of felt together. Um, this is someone who knows nothing about beading, being put on the spot, <laughs> and having to help people bead. I learned a lot without poking myself too much. Um, and then, you know, once the kids had the chance to be able to make their bags, they were learning songs and dancing with them. So I have a short video clip that hopefully we'll play here. Um, and then lastly, here's just a, a picture of one of those vests that were made. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was so neat. I heard some stories from um, parents and kindergarten and first grade teachers about how for the rest of the year, their kids wore their octopus bags to school every day. And they were so proud of them and they wanted to share them to everyone. And I think that that's really evident um, when you look at the face of Tesla in there. And she's just so excited about her octopus bag. And so it was a really cool way to be able to connect with kids in an authentic way.